Well, good morning, I'm Tom Wines. I'm an archeologist, retired from 37 years with the National Park Service. I'm also an adjunct at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And one of the things I've done as an archeologist over the last, I don't know, 25 years or some, is collect tree ring samples for dating. So this is the uh, kind of stuff that we use when we're out there doing, collecting samples and recording information about wood and stuff like that. And like you see in the building behind me here. There's a number of pieces of wood that you can see in the door here, the garage door that's been sealed in, the window lentils, the door lentils. Uh, the vegas are sticking out up over in the side here. So all that kind of wood can tell us information about when this structure might have been built or modified and so forth. So the first thing we like to do, mostly with the help of volunteers, is make a map of the thing that we're gonna, that we're gonna sample. This is the beginning map of this complex behind us here. The building right here, I haven't finished it off yet, the garages. But the uh, important thing is that I want not only the map of the entire site, but also where every piece of wood is located in this thing. And we do that. Secondly, we make a re recording of every piece of wood that's in here, each column, all the attributes that go with that individual piece of wood, its size, where it's located, what kind of piece of wood it is, what it's being used for, whether we sampled it or not, a uh, number of attributes like that, when we sample it, a, a good record for the future so everybody knows sort of what happened with that piece of wood and allows us to enter it into a database so we can do research with it and try to understand construction methods and how people deal with wood and things like that. Obviously a map's really important. We um, shoot them to scale. I don't have the mapping equipment here, it's old style, but shooting it to scale with a, using an engineer scale to make the map in the field. Um, of course, all the measuring tools that you need for making that map. Um, forms that I've developed over the years that I sort of make each one specific to the type of place where I'm working. This is historical stuff set up for historical things that I don't see in prehistoric wood. So each, each area is a little bit different in how they use the wood and so forth, and I try to control for that when I'm observing the wood. And these are the various tools that we use for collecting wood. Um, electric drills, sometimes run off power if you have it, sometimes battery power, a hollow drill bit such as this, and of course, some, you know. So an example of what, what it might look like in the field here for us, and a core that's already been extracted. Um, there's a couple of holes up in here that I took samples from a couple of months ago. And these pieces of wood here, um, also another one right in here. You can see it doesn't make much impression on the piece of wood. And we plug each, each sample with a wooden dowel that I cut at home. And then I stamp the number of the field specimen. That is the number that identifies on the piece of paper and on the map, a plug with this number on it in the piece of wood. You can see it in these, these cores where I have the number of the field specimen to control for which core came from where. And this is generally what they look like when we take cores out. 5 8 inch diameter in this case. I also have smaller drills, half inch drills for more delicate work and I have 7 8 inch diameter drills for heavier work or badly weathered pieces of wood. Aside from cores, which is the usual way we extract samples, as we see here, if we're lucky enough, we can also get, take slices off the wood itself. The wood may be laying loose, or there may be other extent, extenuating circumstances where we can take a piece of a slice out of the wood rather than a core. A slice is always better because you see the entire ring pattern represented on the slice. And different species grow differently, so you really want to see this in, in different kinds of species. And it's a better read for the treeing lab. They're more likely to give you a, a cutting date or a date when this tree was, was harvested than from a core where you can only see a little bit of the outside, like you've got this part of the outside versus this whole thing. <clears throat> so this is always a better way to go, but of course it's much more destructive. And you certainly don't want to do it when it's intact in the structure. People get upset about that. Um, you can see the ring pattern on this particular species here, or this particular sample. You see wide, narrow rings and so forth. And so 
this is just another example of the type of samples we might collect. Loose wood that's laying around and so forth. Um, this one's also a good one that illustrates the outside end treatment that you see on a piece of wood that was cut prehistorically in this case. It's all whittled down. There's no ax marks left on this thing. The whole thing's been nicked or whittled down, making it flat. An enormous amount of work rather than just chop the tree down and put it in the structure as you see fit. That's a minimum kind of work. This is very typical chalk one type of architecture. They do an awful lot of whittling in preparation of the wood that we don't see in other cultures. <coughs> uh, the various tools, I mean, it's one thing to drill it, but when you drill in a core like this in a piece of wood, you get a lot of sawdust. And particularly for juniper, that sawdust can get packed in there and can break your core. So we use a blow tube like this to blow out that sawdust after we drill it every half an inch or inch or so forth. If we don't break the core, we use a hook tool such as this to push it back in there next to the hole and snap the core out of the piece of wood that we drilled. To start the drill, it's very difficult to start a a drill hole in a round piece of wood because that drill will skip along it. We use what we call a starting tool. It's got little teeth on it like this. You push it up there and hold it on there where you start your drill to, to start the hole. Okay. And then finally, if the drill, as it often does, the core gets stuck inside the drill here. Sometimes with the sawdust or if it has sap and things like that, the thing will wedge in there. And so we use a push rod to shove this thing out of the drill bit one way or the other and trying to work it loose so we can get it out there without breaking it. So that's our push rod. And I think that pretty much covers it. I think I talked about the die set here stamped on the numbers that we can control for which piece of wood that core came out of and so forth. Um, oh, the final thing, one of the things we use an awful lot of course is, this is for big vegas and these big buildings, <coughs> a pair of calipers such as these. So I can measure the diameter of pieces of wood. I'm interested not only in the size of the piece, individual piece of wood, but usually the size at both ends. I want to know how many individual trees were cut to produce these, these pieces of wood. Like in Vegas, if, there, if I have almost no taper in the thing at all, then I suspect that they're probably taking two or more pieces of uh, Vegas out of the same tree. So again, I'm interested in labor estimates here in this case. And so by measuring them, I have a better idea of how the size of the tree, how much taper there is, is it a single tree that they cut down, or are we talking about multiple and you know more productive numbers of pieces out of a single tree? A nice, nice set of calipers for doing that. I have a smaller set of calipers, which I don't have on me. And so measuring, we do a lot of measuring in this business. Measuring the length, diameters, how far off the ground it is, and where it's located, and so forth. And I think that sort of covers the general tool kit for a tree collector. Well, I'm interested in architecture, so I'm interested not only in when things were built, but the association of different types of architecture with the tree and the wood that they're using in that architecture. It helps as sort of a, um, a baseline chronology for archaeologists or, pre or historians. When we, when we have architecture, often we don't have dates from them. And if we have that correlate from other studies, we can correlate different kinds of architecture with certain periods of time when things were being built. We have very little information that I know of on Hispanic village architecture. There's been some studies done on churches, but most of the time, doing a whole village like we have here at El Cerrito or San Miguel or San Jose up the line where I've been working, to look at this whole corpus of, of village architecture along the Rio Pecos um, it's something we don't have much of. And so I'm interested in that kind of stuff, the different kinds of wood they're using, uh, some of the stuff that came in on the Santa Fe Trail. I'm interested in whether I can understand milled pieces of lumber that are incised or decorated versus the big round timbers that are cut locally. I'm interested in, in the impact of the local woods here when people are harvesting trees. Did they denude the area for timbers? And I'm interested in how those dates correlate with other things that we see, like in the Santa Fe, opening of the Santa Fe Trail in 1821, I'm seeing lots of construction going on in, on San Miguel, which was the port of entry into, from the United States into Mexico at the time, at that little village just up river here a bit away. So I can tell, I'm looking at various events in history that we do know of 
to see how that reflects in the treating dating and whether there's correlates of various things that are going on that we can correlate from what we're getting out of our treatment. When people left, uh, when the villages may have been closed around the plaza because of Indian threats, any number of things that were interested in the dynamics of a human population. Um, and interested, the Turing dates also, the information the Turing lab gets us, gives us from these samples. The Turing lab, by the way, is at the University of Arizona, and it's the only Turing lab that deals with southwestern archaeological samples. So no other lab does it except the one at Arizona in the southwest. <clears throat> but the kinds of attributes they tell me about wood will give me some idea about the health of the forest that they're collecting it from. Is the forest stressed out? Are we seeing environmental changes that are affecting the trees? Are they dying? Um, or are they, do I have old trees at the beginning of the sequence when you know, they just first moved into an area and you have a variety of aged trees? Or am I getting down to the fact where they've cut most of the old trees down and now we only have younger trees? So you get these little subtle hints about the, 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 stage, of the, or the um, stage of the forest, I guess, and its condition. We're also, of course, from cheering information, we can build chronologies on climate, an extremely powerful climate tool. And now we have both temperature and precipitation yearly for the last 2,000 years or so. So we can really build in the Southwest some incredible chronologies about what the environment was like based on treeing samples. End of story. <laughs>